Good evening. My name is Gerhard Machel. I'm responsible for European Affairs at the Karl Renner Institute. A warm welcome to our online discussion, Kosovo 15 years of independence, that we are organizing jointly the Karl Renner Institute and the International Institute for Peace. We are on the eve of the 15th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence of the youngest state in Europe, of Kosovo. In 2008, if you remember, there was a big debate in the international community, in the media, of course, and among experts on the question if, uh, if it is the right moment to declare this independence, if international law is respected, is respected by this declaration. And uh, as I said, if it's timely and political sensible to declare this independence. Much has happened since, but the question of international law is still relevant, at least for those countries uh, who still haven't recognized the country, and there are quite many. I remind you that even five EU member states haven't uh, declared the recognition of the state of Kosovo. And of course, there are Serbia, Russia, and China. But the good news is that 115 states did recognize Kosovo. Today, in this event, we want to look back at the first 15 years of the country on the successes and failures. But we also want to look uh, on the future, on the, on the perspective, uh, of course, uh, when it comes to the relationship between Kosovo and Serbia, which is very important, we all know. Is there a chance for an agreement in the next couple of months or years? What about this Franco-German uh, proposal for an agreement between the, uh, between the two countries? And uh, is there compromise possible in, when it comes to the status of the uh, Serb uh, minority in Kosovo? Yeah, many questions. And of course, there's the question of uh, EU integration. When will it come um, closer to reality? We are glad that we have uh, three prominent and excellent speakers and experts for this topic. We have Donika Emeni. She is executive director of the CiviCross platform in Kosovo. Now she is in London. But a warm welcome. A warm welcome also to René Schlee, who is a country director of the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung in Kosovo and in North Macedonia. A warm welcome. And now, last but not least, Hannes Svoboda, the president of the International Institute for Peace and former member of the European Parliament. A warm welcome. And of course, the moderator of tonight's discussion, Stephanie Fenkert, the director of the International Institute for Peace. This event uh, is taking place uh, in the framework of our joint initiative, uh, Young Generations for the New Western Balkans Towards Alternative Horizons. Uh, the International Institute for Peace, the Rena Institute, and another fund, uh, institute, the OIP, founded this initiative a few years ago. And the aim is to yeah, to set the spotlight on youth, their stances, hopes, and progressive, um, and to form progressive alliances. This brings me to thank the International Institute for Peace, especially, of course, uh, Stephanie Fenkert, Hannes Woboda, but also Luka Cekic, who is in the background. Thanks a lot for the good cooperation, as always, and uh, for having this event together with us, the Rennes Institute. So let me wish you an interesting event on the occasion of the 15th anniversary, uh, anniversary of Kosovo's independence. And by this, I'd like to hand over to you, Stephanie. Thank you very much, uh, Gerhard, for the nice introduction. Also, a very warm welcome from my side. Uh, you already said um, we are dealing with the Western Balkans together since many, many years. And also Donika has been part of our group since 2018, if I'm not 
mistaken. And uh, Donika is also the, uh, the, um, the person I'm going to kick off uh, the discussion with, but uh, maybe just in general, I would like just to, to, to give the idea that we should have like an open dialogue between the experts here. And I would also like to, to ask everyone who is uh, joining us online also to post questions in the Q and A section. And my colleague is also looking at Facebook. So uh, please feel free to answer any questions. I will go through them while uh, our guests are talking and discussing. Um, Donika, Gerhard already mentioned several things. I mean, it's tomorrow is going to be the 15th anniversary, more than 100 uh, states already recognized Kosovo. But what is also very important is that five European Union countries did not recognize it, plus also two members of the Security Council, which is obviously Russia and China, for other reasons than the European uh, countries, I would say, mostly also dealing with uh, what uh, the, the Serbian opposition in this. The French-German proposal was mentioned, but in general, I would say the question in Kosovo right now is um, when we look at the, at the Franco-German proposal and also that Vucic recently has been pushed maybe to give in to some concessions, especially by the European Union, I would say a move which wasn't really foreseen by many uh, recently. What would you say, I mean, what is um, the big question, how to address the big question. Should it be like a mutual recognition? Should it be like a step-by-step -step de facto recognition which might lead to mutual recognition at one point? What is your um, idea on the last 15 years uh, of independence of Kosovo? How would you assess the situation right now and especially also the new dynamics? And Monica, the floor is yours. And I'm very happy that you made it again and, and to join our discussion, especially today. Yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot, Stephanie. And of course, good evening to all of you. I'm very happy to join, obviously. And uh, and thanks for always organizing events on Western Balkans, but also of Kosovo specifically. I'm very happy to also join my co-panelists. And uh, actually, I'm, I'm I'm very looking very much looking forward to this discussion because uh, uh, I cannot believe this, but you know, like this is really a, a critical juncture for 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 Kosovo, but also for the region. And obviously, we cannot exclude the elephant in the room and what is actually behind this and is the war in Ukraine because you know if it wasn't for the uh, security emergency that was raised after the Russian aggression in Ukraine uh, we would still and the EU would still be very satisfied with whatever the status quo would, would you know sort of bring in the Western Balkans and they would be um, happy with the incremental approach that they were sort of using since the launch of the dialogue. Every time I, I think, I mean, every anniversary of independence, I uh, remember, you know, this is a personal story, but I always remember the conversation I had with my father in 2008 when we were waiting for the Declaration of Independence. And for him, it was like, okay, we are closing a very important chapter for Kosovo and we are finally getting rid of, you know, the key problem that was there for Kosovo, which is Serbia. And then we are going to uh, sort of flourish internally and of course, you know, in foreign policy. And I remember back then telling him, I always give him bad news and I, I you know, telling him like, look, you know, this is a milestone, obviously, under today's set of circumstances, because we would not be able to actually declare independence because with, you know, geopolitical sort of balance in, in, in the world. Uh, and in 2008, this was still possible, you know, like we, we caught the last train last wagon and then you know i told him like but we are going to have a lot of challenges internally and externally internally you will see how difficult it is to actually have your own institutions go through state building institutional building and eu reforms which are very demanding even for the countries that actually had institutions before kosovo like those in the region and then of course you know there is the other one that is international recognition and in the beginning for him, it was, you know, sort of like, no, no, like it's going to be better because, you know, Kosovo was gaining a lot of recognitions. It was until we hit the maximum, until we couldn't anymore, uh, because we really sort of got all the recognition we could from the West, apart from five non-recognizers within the EU, which we will talk, of course, later when we talk about genuine French plan and everything. And the second one is obviously, obviously related to, to the fact that, um, Kosovo hardly made it in international cooperation mechanisms, which is still, you know, a very big challenge. And internally, Kosovo was, uh, of course, not performing the way we actually expected. And five, 15 years after this morning, because of this panel, I had a discussion with him. I called him and I asked him, like, how is it going? And he goes, like, what is happening with the German-French plan? Are we, you know, like, finally going to, to close this issue with Serbia? And clearly, you know, he got to know how difficult it is. And the fact that 15 years after, we are still facing a pre-2008 sort of 
situation in which we were waiting to see how Vienna negotiations will go and then, you know, what, what it will bring. And now we are still, you know, in the same situation, another set of negotiations, but sort of almost similar circumstances. Uh, and uh, obviously Kosovo has been going through a lot of challenges, apart from successes, of course, being an independent state and having the ICJ decision and then uh, finalizing the, the, um, the supervised independence. But before that, we actually were launched into Kosovo-Serbia dialogue. And this was uh, one of the key events because it's not only determined the way we actually looked outside, but also the way we functioned internally. So, I mean, dialogue with Serbia, Rene will, will tell you because he's, you know, very active in Kosovo. It's not a foreign policy issue for Kosovo. It is everywhere. It is the, in the public narrative internally. It, it determines how the, fun, uh, the country functions. Uh, the political elite have, you know, basically used this issue similarly to Serbia. Of course, always, you know, sort of sidelining reforms and feeding the nationalist narratives and keeping this, you know, Kosovo Serbia issue ongoing. And now, after the war in Ukraine, this has become, of course, more urgent. Uh, before the war in Ukraine, we had a lot of crises in the north, but it wasn't that much urgent for the Western uh, world. I mean, I remember in 2000 and. Uh, 20, you know, we had, you know, very, very serious crisis in the north and the Twitter community and the media wasn't really reacting the way they did when it happened in 2021 after the war in Ukraine. Because now, you know, there is one issue, like what if there is another war in the Balkans, apart from, you know, the Ukraine, and uh, the EU has not, you know, does not have the political or military capital to deal with it. And that's why we reached to the point of German-French plan, which we will probably discuss later, but also the problem with the association, something that has been dragging on since 2013. So um, this opened a new sort of window of opportunity to solve the issue. And uh, now we are facing, of course, a lot of pressure from the uh, US and the EU, obviously, Irene knows this as well, uh, being the one who actually you know, uh, worked on the, the uh, draft statute of the uh, ASM and looking at how you know, the world actually, you know, like people in Kosovo reacted to it. And then obviously we are waiting for another window to open now. And uh, that window is still uncertain whether it's going to be just a second normalization agreement, which will still keep the issue open meaning that there will be no recognition. This has been so, sort of um, almost revealed. Uh, even the US, you know, the Blinken letters, you know, this time did not have the mutual recognition. Uh, so now we still don't know how the future is going to look like, but I will be happy to discuss in, 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 um, in uh, later on when, uh, after, you know, Rennes and Hannes's uh, uh, interventions. Thank you very much, Dominika. I mean, you already mentioned several issues, and and I think Hannes can also add to that. Add to that. So, uh, my question to you, Hannes, would be: I mean, from your experience, um, you have been a parliamentarian for the European Union, dealing with the Western Balkans for many, many years, already since the nineties. Uh, recently, you wrote a blog about fifteen years of independence in Kosovo, and maybe if I just may, may, might add, I mean, I was also searching in the internet right now. I mean, what has been published on this occasion, and it, it was very few actually. So, I mean, this is, of course, also in line because of there is another very, very, um, I would say, sad um, anniversary next year, which is the first uh, year of the of the war started in Ukraine. So the focus is very much there. But I think it is still very important to talk about Kosovo. It is our neighboring region. And the title of your blog, Hannes, was um, 15 years of independence of Kosovo, independent, but yet incomplete. So maybe you could share a little bit about uh, from your experience. I mean, what conclusion for Kosovo can you draw, can you draw since independence? And maybe since Donika also mentioned, you know, the, these very very difficult issues about state building, institution building. You were also rapporteur for the accession to the European Union of Croatia. So maybe what would be like what advice would you give uh, now to the Kosovo um, government uh, when it comes to the proposal we are going to discuss later? But how they should approach uh, any future negotiations and the, the elephant in the room is of course the, the Christian Belgrade dialogue. Hannes, um, the floor is yours. Yeah, first of all, thank you very much and uh, welcome to all of the participants here. Um, I was the first time in Kosovo in 1907, beginning of 1907, uh, and I saw and we spoke with Kosovo representatives, uh, Ibrahim Rugova, but also with the Serb uh, representatives. I saw 
what was happening in Kosovo. Many people still don't want to see it or speak about Kosovo. Even many Serbs speak about Kosovo, never have been in Kosovo. I saw how the Serb uh, administration at that time uh, treated the Kosovo Albanians. Uh, so for me, it was clear the situation as it was then was not tenable, could not be uh, prolonged into the future. In the first uh, years, I thought, well, a solution can be found inside Serbia with a special autonomy given back, autonomy which was taken away by Milosevic. But I saw it is not possible. But there was no movement, no change in the attitude of, of the Serb uh, uh, politicians in the majority uh, towards the Albanians. And of course, the Albanians, after the war, they, they got uh, strong support. So my final verdict was on the eve of independence, there is no other way to, than, to be, than to declare this independence. Now, what we saw also as parliamentarian afterwards was of course a very difficult process of accepting by the majority of the minority. Well, when I spoke about minority, I uh, was often criticized by Serbs. We are not minority here. We are still, you know, it's Serbia. And the Albanians are the minority. But on the other hand, of course, many Albanian parliamentarians did not you know, treat the Serb colleagues in a collegial way. I couldn't understand it because after the war, after the atrocities, but still this integration was not happening enough and is still not happening enough. Now, again, emotionally, I can understand that uh, to integrate representatives of the former, let's say, colonial power, is not an easy thing. But this is what I meant with incomplete or yet not complete, is that the integration inside the country is not happening enough. Is it the Kosovo Albanian majority responsible or the Serb minority? Well, both sides, that the Serb minority, especially those in the north, uh, in well, the Mitrovica, uh, they are very often not accepting that the, Kosovo is independent. They just don't want to be integrated. But on the other hand, of course, integration must happen. Now, the, the present Prime Minister Kurti says, well, everybody has the same right, so everybody has the same chance. Well, we don't differentiate between Albanians and Serbs, which is theoretically a good concept. But at the end of the day, you have to give the Serb uh, uh, minority some sort of a collective rights. And that's what uh, Donig already mentioned is this question of uh, the association of the Serb communities, especially in the North. So this integration process must be promoted, of course, from both sides, but the majority is in a stronger position, as always. So the majority must, uh, you know, give the hand and say, please come. It will be a difficult process. I understand the fears that any kind of collective rights you give to a minority, to a certain minority, will be misused, you know. But on the other hand, there is no other way. And my experience, because you asked, Stephanie, about uh, Croatia, my experience was very clear. Croatia could go forward when they started to integrate the Serb, also the Serb community, minority in Croatia, uh, bringing it into government, in, into a responsible position, and to forget about it. In some way, you have to forget about the past. It's, it's, it's easy, crimes have been done, still uh, people are miss missing, uh, and, and you don't know what happened to them, but one has to look into the future. And therefore, I think, uh, yeah, I don't know how Donica sees the, the things in the detail, but I think it is a difficult process, it has to go forward, but I hope that this kind of Franco-German proposal, which would include, of course, the promised and already agreed federation of the Serb communities on the one hand, and at least de facto recognition of, of um, uh, Kosovo by, by Serbs, would bring us some step forward. It will still need some time, and at last word to this, five countries from the European Union, it's, it's very irresponsible. The, the internal problems which are responsible for that kind of position and in Catalonia, in Scotland, uh, the Hungarian minority in Slovakia and the question of division in Cyprus, 
they are not changing in any way or influenced in any way by the question of uh, the Kosovo. So for them, um, this irresponsible behavior of these governments of these five countries should change immediately and give a chance for the mutual recognition of Kosovo by all member countries of the European Union, which could also then convince still some other countries to recognize the, uh, the Kosovo independence again. Many successes, yes, but still some open question I would conclude. Thank you very much, uh, Hannes. Uh, you mentioned um, very often, and I also did, and Gerhard did, and so did Donika, this uh, so-called French-German um, proposal. And I think this is also what we are going to talk about in a little bit of a different context now, where with uh, uh, René, René Schley, um, is country director um, um, of the Friedrich Ebert uh, Foundation in Kosovo and in North Macedonia. And together with the European Peace Institute, you just published in January a study on the draft statue, um, a draft statue of the Association of Municipalities in the Republic of Kosovo, in which the Kosovo Serb community is in majority. So we also know that in December, I mean, there was this um, outbreak of violence. It was also discussed very much in, in Western media in, in the north of the country, especially in Mitrovica, you know, this whole uh, with the license place. Uh, uh, license plates and then also with the um, imprisoning of this uh, police officer. So there was a little bit of a very big tensions, I would say, like even since many, many years uh, did not even happen in Kosovo. Um, so I think it is really the right time also to discuss uh, this idea again. However, the idea itself is not really new. And I think uh, this is normally what Donika is always saying. We are recycling a lot of ideas and frameworks which have been on the table for many, many years already. So my question to you would be if you maybe can give us a little bit of an idea of this um, new association of municipalities, um, this document, like is it complementary to this also Franco-German suggestion? What are the main ideas? What is new? And also what I think is also very important, uh, how is it perceived so far? Maybe also in Kosovo, in the region, and probably also within the broader context being especially the European Union. Thanks for joining, uh, René, the floor is yours. Many questions. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much, Stephanie, for, for the questions. And first of all, thank you so much for the kind invitation. And I'm very excited to be here with you and also uh, with my fellow panelists. So thank you again for the kind invitation. And yeah, you mentioned the, the association. And uh, of course, I also want to get back into a conversation with Donika. I'm a bit of more of an optimist. I think that is just uh, uh, when it comes to the progress of 15 years of uh, after independence of Kosovo, I think that is just a professional, uh, professional disease to be an optimist. But uh, maybe we can get into this later. So uh, as you asked many, uh, many questions, Stephanie, I want to get right to it. So. Uh, I think you rightly outlined that, uh, and and I fully and I would fully agree with Donika. There, there have been many ideas recycled. So, what's the novelty uh, about this uh, draft statute, the proposal that we presented? I think the novelty is that it's public. Um, it is the first public proposal for the for such an association, and uh, I mean the dialogue uh, is notorious for being very intransparent. And at some point, uh, the the big players come come out of some meeting rooms, often back uh, uh, background meetings, backdoor meetings, and then present something to the public and say, "Here, this is the deal done." So. Uh, what we wanted to try to achieve with this um, draft statute and as such, it is, let's say, around surrounding the association, there are many questions. And uh, first of the first question, it's a political one, is uh, should you do an association at all? Like, uh, and maybe we can get too into that, but that is not a question that uh, we address in this statute. It is basically how we approach it is, this is part of a cooperation, as you so outlined with the European Institute of Peace, where we're saying like, look, we see this issue of often referred to ASM, right? We see this ASM issue as a potential roadblock in the ongoing discussions with the normalization. So what we wanted to present was a publicly available proposal, a concrete, something concrete. So it was a statute. So, I mean, in theory, somebody could take this over and uh, make it into a government regulation and it would be deal done. That's not what we want, right? So it's just a proposal for the public debate. I think there will be plenty of more stakeholders to include, plenty of more discussion to be had, plenty of improvements maybe also to be made on the draft. But 
As such, it should be a publicly available proposal and for to move the to move the discussion forward in a constructive manner on a highly contentious issue. I mean, the the issue of let's say the association, uh, especially among the Kosovo Albanians in Kosovo, is um, as you already said, um, a very a very contentious one. And there, and the uh, Kurti government, um, so the prime minister has voiced concerns over the establishment of such, a, such an association, association repeatedly. So what we tried to do is like when we started this drafting process one year ago, so to answer your question, yes, I see it as complementary to the French German proposal, but actually we started let's say before, because we're getting asked all the time, like, did the German government ask you to do this or no, this is something that we, as an independent political foundation came up long before the, this proposal uh, was on the table. So when we drafted this, um, we had the following, uh, we had the following in mind. First of all, um, no, uh, I mean, or I want to say no Republic Serbska, but actually the objective was it has to be a it has to work, the statute has to work within the existing legal and regulatory framework of Kosovo, because there was a there was a ruling by the Constitutional Court of Kosovo in 2015 on the Brussels Agreement, maybe we can get to this later, but in short, it said, like, look, the association, you can do it, but as it is now, it is not fully in line with the Constitution. So what we took was this, this decision by the Constitutional Court that gave guidance on how to draft not exactly how to draft the statute, but provided some guidance on what it, uh, what it could look like. So, and the first one was no executive power. So in the statute or in this association, as in this proposal, as we, as we see it, it does not undermine in any way um, the, the authority and competencies of either the federal government or the municipalities, but it, is, but it functions as a coordinated body. The second objective of the drafting was that, of course, it should provide it should provide an offer uh, for meaningful services for the for the residents uh, of this uh, of these municipalities. See, I choose my uh, words carefully there, and I'm saying like residents of these municipalities. It is not just about the Serbs or just about the Albanians. It is about the residents of the municipalities. Yeah? Of course, in line of the in line with the dialogue. The municipalities and vision for the, that association are those municipalities in which the Kosovo Serbs are a majority, but that is, uh, as such, it is, let's say, not a mono ethnic uh, um, association. And the third, so the first objective was it has to be in line with Kosovo's constitution. The second objective uh, was okay, it has to offer a meaningful service to the residents of the municipality. And the third objective was, of course, it has to be recognized as a fulfillment of the international obligations, because you can rightly ask, okay, these Brussels agreements, these were, what, 2013, 15, a long time ago, why are we talking so much about this issue now? And of course, they are linked to the normalization dialogue. And so whatever the proposal should be, is our our aim was that it is seen as a fulfillment of the international obligations uh, of Kosovo. Because if you ask the governments of the so-called Quint format or other governments, including Austria, um, and you ask like, why should Kosovo do this now? And the main argument is always from the diplomats is, well, it is an international obligation, something that the Kurti government inherited. So it's not, I mean, a long time has passed since the constitutional court ruling 2015. Other governments haven't touched it, but history now, uh, let's say, let the chip fall into uh, Mr. Kuti uh, uh, or into the governments uh, of Mr. Of, uh, of Mr. Kuti. So he has to deal with it now. And there is a lot of pressure. I think Donika already mentioned it. And so our objective with this concrete proposal was like to say, um, let's say, to offer something very concrete as a public discussion, because we take the concerns both of the population, but also from the government very seriously. Um, but I think the in order to move forward with the discussion and in line with uh, what Hannes said, let, let's orientate towards, let's say, the future, let's see how we can get forward. I think it is best to, to have a discussion of these concerns very concretely on a concrete draft. 
Yeah. And in that, if you ask if there's anything novelty, um, is if there's any novelty to it, then this would be the approach. The last point I would just try to make how we are how we are doing this. Uh, if you're concerned, I didn't write it myself. Uh, this is nothing that we had a bunch of experts uh, in in Germany or something. But and this is how we always do it in the Friedrich Hebert Foundation. We work with partners from civil society in Kosovo, both from the communities from the Kosovo Serb communities, but also the Kosovo Albanians community, and let's say of course, uh, and come up with a draft. We had an extensive legal review of set of the of the statute. So we're very confident that it is constitutional, right as it is now. Um, and this is why it took so long, uh, because the draft earlier versions were leaked in September, and it was all a bit a lot of furor. Uh, President Vucic was very angry with us and uh, that we dealt with it at all. Uh, so a lot of controversy, but hopefully, Good I sign. think <laughs> That's a good sign that he was there. Yeah, probably, probably. And <laughs> and then so what we hope what we hope for with this public uh, pleasant, uh, presentation is that we let's say move past the controversy and these kind of buzzwords like no republic serbska. It's like yeah, nobody I talk to wants another republic serbska and I, and I and I think we should just um send out the message <clears throat> to the Kosovars. We take your concerns seriously. And I think that message is sometimes missing also from the diplomats. Like we take this seriously because they're all hammering down on, let's say, Kosovo should fulfill their international obligation. I agree on that, but it's, I mean, it doesn't hurt to also add, but we hear you, yeah? Uh, yeah. And um, and then hopefully we can have a constructive uh, now discussion on, on, on set association. I'm not sure whether I covered all your questions, but I really tried. So, but please feel free to ask. That's perfect. That's perfect. And I think also Donika and Hannes will also share some ideas on that as well. And um, here again, I would also like to invite again all our the audience, if you have any questions, please um, write them in the queue and a section. I will go through them. And please also on Facebook, um, if you're interested or if you have something you would really like to share or to, to dig deeper into. Nonika, uh, after what you just heard, I mean, uh, let's discuss a little bit. Um, OK, you just disappeared, but I think you're coming back. Um, let's discuss a little bit about uh, what is your opinion on this um, proposal, on this Franco-German proposal, or also this uh, statue of munip municip municipalities um, in the Republic of, of Kosovo. René said Albin Kurti did actually more or less inherit this idea because it is somehow based on this uh, Brussels Agreement from 2013, which was overruled then in part by the Constitutional Court. So um, does Kurti or Vucic, do they actually want to have some agreement on this one. What would you say? And then maybe also, uh, what is your opinion? I mean, do you think, um, Hannes also mentioned a little bit, it's also this collective uh, versus individual rights. But then René again said it's only on the local level. So this is also the idea of this agreement. It shouldn't really touch on the federal level. So it's mostly based on, on education, healthcare, uh, land planning, economic development, so on the local level. So what would be your assessment of this uh, Franco-German proposal or then even to the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung and European Peace Institute um, statute of this association? Yeah, I mean, uh, sorry for, for the glitch, but uh, no, I definitely did not call uh, uh, the um, the publication of FES, something that has been recycled, but rather, you know, the EU decremental approach. And this was from our last event in Vienna. And I, uh, and I reacted to the uh, so-called agreements on IDs and, and freedom of movement, which was like constantly being added on or complemented and, you know, heralded as a success. And the other one on car registration plates, which were actually tweets and not not actual agreements, at least we haven't seen what has been signed. And, and that's why which even said that it was just, you know, like an, uh, a verbal agreement, but that there is no document from it. But then, you know, coming back to the association, the draft uh, of the statute, I mean, obviously what, what FAS produced was really comprehensive uh, and it really had all the elements that we need to actually have a discussion. I was rather disappointed that this, you know, uh, activity did, wasn't done by the government. Uh, and instead, you know, FAS had to do it, like completely external actor, which is actually good. I mean, obviously, but I was expecting actually from, from the Kurti government to either have an alternative, saying like no to association, 
because it's inherited and we do not agree with it, obviously, uh, then it's a legal process. You have to go through through the the, um, the parliament and annul it. But you know, uh, if you know you are completely against it, at least take a stand and do something about it or if you are going to implement it then you know start to actually take tangible and and real steps towards uh, uh towards forming uh the establishing the association or at least start having the discussion about it uh every government in kosovo even those who actually signed the association and voted for the associations in the parliament uh the um they had red lines and 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 here i'm talking about you know the former hoti government which actually you know was like all red line to association but it was exactly some mustafa and hoti where they were in power who actually you know sort of went through with it and they have these red lines sort of completely alienating uh the uh the public opinion about it and completely sidelining an obligation right because it's an it's an agreement that has been uh, not only signed, but went through the parliament in Kosovo. Uh, so uh, instead, I was waiting for Kurti to actually have either an alternative to the association saying, you know, this is bad and we propose this instead, or like take, you know, steps to actually uh, talk about it in, in, in the debate instead, uh, in the public debate. Instead, it was like constantly uh, sort of... Um, urging these narratives against it and linking it to Republican Serbia, which is actually the basic mistakes that we often make. You know, like, it is true, Republika Srpska, it is how it is, and the, the problems that it has, uh, it creates for Bosnia to, to function internally. But then, you know, let's also... Um, admit the fact that Bosnia is also having a different system of functioning it's a federation and then you know like it's different layers of decision making and it's not just about the republika srpska that bosnia it is how it is and uh, this is something that we have to keep in mind and the fact that you know republika srpska has uh, you know and all this you know establishment has been negotiated during the war so it was like ceasefire sort of you know uh, uh situation in the case of kosovo and serbia there is peace countries have like solid negotiations, uh, uh, experience already, and they can negotiate it better. And they can establish something that is better than that. But I totally understand, you know, how, how Kurti actually, you know, sort of uh, navigates around it. Because first, you know, it was inherited. Second, it is, he came to power actually saying no to it. Uh, and it is very difficult to now change the narrative immediately after because the public opinion in Kosovo is very interesting. If Kurdi goes against it, they say like, oh, look what you're doing to the country internally and externally. It's because of you that, you know, your lack of constrict constructivity that we are having all these problems, you know, not only internally, but also with our with our uh, partners like US and EU. And if he does it, they say like, oh, look, you're doing exactly something that you have been opposing Historically, so for Kurdi, it's a very, very problematic situation to be. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, we are pretending at least to be a serious state. And if we are so, we'll have to address, you know, an agreement that has been signed and, you know, decide on the future steps and not only claim that we are doing this either because of the EU or the US pressure. This is, you know, the, 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 the first uh, um, a step that Kosovo has to do. Uh, the second one is obviously, you know, what Kurti has missed as a chance is to, of this, you know, like starting this internal dialogue. And I'm not talking about the Serbs only because he came to power sort of saying that I will come to power and everything that will be decided in Brussels, at least, you know, that is real linked to the northern part of Kosovo will be decided with the local Serbs in this internal dialogue. And what happened is that, that you know, like this dialogue with Serbs did not happen, but he completely also detached from us as well. So this debate is not happening among Albanians as well. So like we are completely sort of, you know, out of the process and just waiting for when the US or someone of third party will come up with a draft and then we will either sign it or not sign it under pressure and and, and see what's what's going on so we are still having in the in, in both countries leaders that are actually calculating on elections when they 
even when they deal with such important uh, uh, processes. And then the third element is that, you know, he's negotiating with Vucic and negotiating with Vucic is not easy. I mean, look at also the EU and how the EU navigates around him, uh, specifically after the war in Ukraine and the fact that, you know, to date, Serbia refuses to uh, impose sanctions against Russia. And you have EU and the US with all mechanisms and leverage that they can use and they don't do it yet. Uh, so it is very difficult to actually navigate around Vucic as a uh, a counterpart. Uh, so these are the elements around the association. And then, of course, it's lack of trust. Because obviously, you know, in Kosovo, there is no problem with, you know, uh, the Serbian minority having more rights. Uh, because the Atisari package is already something, you know, that, uh, I mean, you, you all know the fact that in the parliament we have double majority. So if it's a matter of, you know, national interests or interests of the minorities in Serbia, it cannot go through. We need two thirds of the minorities in the parliament to actually vote for it, not just the two, the general two thirds. So this double majority already has established, you know, this complexity at the national level. And, you know, when it comes to municipalities in Kosovo, I mean, René knows this because they went through all the legal uh, 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 sort of bases in Kosovo. But municipalities have a, a lot, you know, uh, responsibilities and executive powers after decentralization process. So there is nothing to actually to fear because, you know, they're the power and it's already in municipalities' hands. Uh, so, uh, but all this debate around the association is specifically because there is lack of trust, because everything that happened during and after the Brussels agreement, especially with how Vucic through Lista Srpska managed to monopolize political representation, control the, the, the local Serbs heavily. I mean, we know the problems that they go through, especially during the election. So uh, this lack of trust sort of made Kosovo feel, you know, a little bit more reluctant to actually do it, feeling, uh, fearing something similar to, you know, Bosnia happening to Kosovo internally and externally. But as a matter of fact, the association might not be uh, existing formally, but informally does exist. Because, I mean, we see uh, there is the educa Serbian education system in Kosovo. There is a health education, uh, health system of Serbia in Kosovo. There is obviously money coming through to Kosovo, which is uh, completely something that we cannot track. And with the association and formalizing it, maybe we'll be able to actually see how many, you know, millions are entering Kosovo through Serbia, which is, you know, an issue of lack of transparency. Not only a problem for Kosovo, but also from Serbia. I see my colleagues in Serbia constantly asking, where is the money going? And, and what are you, go you doing with the amount of money? Because obviously it's not even public as a general amount. So this is something that the progressive government uh, uh, could have done. And I was strongly believing that Kurti and Osmani as a very, very good tandem would actually be able to do it. But then they obviously missed the chance. And now we're dealing with this international pressure, which is obviously, as René said, it's unfair because it's, it's, it's constantly going to Kosovo as the weakest party, the weakest link in, in the process. And uh, Kosovo is the weakest party because of the EU five non recognizers, because they have cemented and formalized this asymmetry that the EU has towards, you know, both parties. And I'm uh, intentionally jumping to, to, to the five non recognizers because it is, you know, the reason why the EU is lacking success and the reason why there is very little trust at least in Kosovo, towards the EU as, you know, facilitator or leader of, of these negotiations. And that's why most of the, you know, even public opinion, less of Kurti, sort of are pro more EU, uh, US uh, involvement, because believe in that it will be our partners, you know, traditional partners, those who are actually going to sort of at least, you know, make this asymmetry less less uh, present and less visible. And then, of course, this comes to to our friend German plan, for which Kosovo has accepted, uh, and we still don't know what's in there. Uh, so that, this this is also disappointing from Kurti's Kurti's part because uh, he was alongside us as civil society asking for more transparency when he was opposition, and then when he joined, uh, when he actually became prime minister, he completely forgot about the transparency part of the dialogue, and he moved on without even including the opposition because the opposition has been included either by the EU or the US or informed or briefed but not so much from, from, from Kurdi. So we know that you know, uh, Kurdi has accepted it. We don't know what's in, in there, but we know there is no 
uh, mutual recognition. So it's probably, you know, marking the 10 year of Brussels agreement. So 2013, 2023, making another breakthrough in which, you know, we will just see a uh, probably summary of all agreements signed so far. And this will make Porti uh, give him ownership in the process. Because after this, he won't be able to say, I wasn't part of the process, I've inherited this, but you know, I've signed it and I will take full responsibility for it. Whether do they want it or not, obviously it is very problematic because uh, they claim they want to have a breakthrough and you know, close this issue. But the political elites in both Kosovo and Serbia have worked on completely different, the opposite side. Uh, basically, um, this open conflict uh, manages to divert attention from actual real issues on the ground. Uh, and if you look like how countries are performing, and I'm not talking about, you know, some re reports that, you know, have moved Kosovo forward or, you know, like in, in, in the ranking, but I'm talking about real tangible success on the ground. It is lacking. Uh, we are stuck in the narratives of the 90s. We can't get out of it. And it's very difficult to plan a forward-looking future in both countries and in the region. And, you know, this is a, a very problematic issue uh, in, in the future. Uh, obviously, for Vucic, uh, solving this issue is not going to be very convenient uh, because, I mean, we know the reasons uh, uh, internally, but also there is the Russia element in it. Uh, and uh, closing the entry point, geopolitical entry point for Russia in the Balkans is problematic for Serbia because this partnership for Serbia has been effective, not for Serbia, but for Vucic. You know, he has obviously uh, 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 now a solid position internally. I mean, have you seen the, the scenes from the parliament? Obviously, that is a stage scene, a stage opposition of, of Vucic, uh, sort of to, to make the opposition look more pro-Russian and less progressive than him. So then he again can emerge as the only partner that the West has in Serbia in relation to Kosovo. And this is also the case in, in Kosovo when you see like all the problems internally. So uh, unfortunately, uh, I'm very skeptical. Um, I mean, I think when people ask me whether there will be an agreement between Kosovo and Serbia, then it's, sorry, I'm very pessimistic, but you know, like living live in this reality forever is very painful from actually studying it. And I'm doing both, but you know, like living it's even worse. And uh, is that, I do believe it will happen, but whether it will solve the issue between Kosovo and Serbia, that's the question. And I don't think that's going to happen because if, you know, it's ambiguous, if, if it doesn't have, you know, tangible sort of timeline and recognition, it will be yet another 10 years of us trying to deconstruct that agreement, trying to make the parties uh, implement that agreement. And we will waste yet another 10 years stuck in the 90s and still dealing with each other. In, 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 and, and not dealing with actual real problems of, you know, uh, of young people now. Thanks, Tonika. That, you mentioned many, many different things, uh, including uh, also the, the topic of the European Union and the future of Kosovo in this context. But I would leave that maybe for a little bit later and would still like stick uh, one more question to this, uh, to this association of muni municipalities. And the question now goes to both, to René and to Hannes. So my idea is, I mean, how are you responding also to this criticism that, that this formation of, the, of this association of municipalities reinforces already existing dividing lines on ethnic grounds. This is very important, especially for the reason because of the wars in the 90s, obviously, which have been mainly also ethnic wars. And I think uh, this is also what, what differs it from other um, things which are happening for the non-recognizers who are always claiming to say that Kosovo would actually set the president, but the history is a very different one. So because very often also the, the um, South Tyrol is also mentioned uh, as an idea to, as a blueprint more or less for, for functioning autonomy in, in Northern Italy. But again, I mean, South Tyrol didn't have like this experience of war, uh, of uh, expulsion, etc. And also there is still the, the open issue of uh, reconciliation, which did not happen in the region. And we, International Institute for Peace, like we did like a big project dealing with the whole region and how far reconciliation happened since the end of the wars. And it, it was very dire, like it was, 
actually did not really happen. So there is still this uh, non-reconciliation looming above everything. So how would you actually react to this criticism that especially now that um, like formation of uh, associations based on ethnicity more or less um, is uh, reinforcing ethnic um, division again? Um, this is something which is also, I mean, Republika Srpska, I don't want to mention it again, but we know the same discussion from Bosnia and Herzegovina between the d three different groups. So maybe Rene, uh, you uh, Hannes, you first, and maybe then um, uh, Rene on the same question. And I have many more, and there's also already one. Well, I think the, you, you mentioned the basic issue, which is um, how to deal with this. I would say the following uh, the separation couldn't be worse, it couldn't be stronger than it is now. I don't think I already mentioned it, you know, uh, in some way, those leaders live quite happily because Serbia still has this influence by financing many issues uh, and obligations in, in the cities and the municipalities in the north, and Kosovo doesn't have to pay for it. So in some way, I fear that the pessimism of Doniga generally is right, that the two leaders uh, can live with the status quo unless the pressure from European Union and the US is strong. I mean, Donica mentioned the US and, and the, the affiliation of the Kosovo Albanians with the US. The US is at the moment the most uh, uh, critical about uh, Kurti because Kurti is spoiling their good relation with Vucic, the US relation with Vucic. But coming back to your question, I think the, the, the big issue is the education because when you have separate educational system, for the Serbs and for the Albanians, then the, the, the different narrative of all the things which happened in the past, not only you know, the past uh, 20 years, but in the past centuries will be st still stuck and fixed for the Serbs. One attitude and one opinion and one orientation, one narrative and for the Albanian another one. If you have these two different narratives, you will never come together. You know perfectly well, we discussed it also in, in Bosnia and Herzegovina, the question of the education and this different education according to the ethnicity is a very bad one. So here is my most critical point about the separate developments. The other issues are not so not so, so bad, but I think what, what could and the Kurdish government, and I, I, I have this uh, split uh, attitude towards him in some way, he was at least the hope to overcome this uh, war generation and to have another outlook to the future. But I agree with Donica that he disappoints, also me personally, because I have a good personal relationship with him, that he is not bringing forward uh, Kosovo in the sense of looking into the future. And the future must be one of reconciliation, of bringing people together, of a dialogue. We know also from very critically Serb young uh, uh, groups in, in the north who, who are critical to this uh, 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 and this official people in the north that they feel they are not really supported or accepted or promoted by, by the Kurdish government. So uh, I think one should start to do it. I don't know the, all the details uh, of the proposal uh, of, of Friedrich Ebert Stiftung, but we should start with some very concrete project of these communities. At the same time, we should, or Kosovo should think about, especially the Kurti government, how we can bring to a real dialogue about the development of, of Kosovo in the past centuries and the past decades, history projects, uh, uh, and a real dialogue about it to bring people together. Not that they will have the same opinion what happened. This is not easy and, and will not happen in the next years, but at least to start that also the Kosovo Albanian side sees that the problems of the uh, Serb people and, and, and the loss of the Serbs when they lost their home country, so to say, but the Serbs have also to accept that what the Serb administration and politicians did in the past were some sort of a colonialism to make it openly. And it's, it's the, the Kosovo, uh, Kosovo Foundation and Kosovo independence is, is an element and a step of decolonization. But decolonization is one thing, but to build a new common society is another thing. And this is still the open question. Thank you. René, same question to you. 
Yeah, if I uh, thanks thanks for the question. So um, I think for uh, the statute or the association or the the concrete proposal, I mean, it is basically um, well, it's yet another institution, right? Uh, and there is in Kosovo, there's this saying in Kosovo, we have the best institutions, yeah. Um, and because so much is based on uh, European best practices, the laws they are written there. And I think in the end, it all will depend on the implementation. And that is what I think many concerns come from. And uh, it goes and it ties back actually very neatly to the second part of your question. It's about good faith. It is about reconciliation. And it is about reflecting or what is the political reality right now. So uh, with with a proposal that, that, we, that we produced uh, with the statutes, let's say we did the utmost in order to prevent I mean, having that in mind uh, to prevent furthering e ethnic tensions. Yeah, uh, we put a lot of safeguards in there um, in terms of, let's say, that whatever the association does, let's say, will be monitored by the general auditor. Um, have many provisions there that ensuring, let's say, the rights of all ethnic communities in the um, in the municipalities. And making sure that um, that everything basically is tied to the municipality. So let's say one fear is that just again, like it will that this association will basically institutionalize the status quo in terms of okay, then there will be the president of such an association and the new kind of king of, king of the north. Yeah, uh, and then um, and but for that we we made a provision that basically all the all the offices in such an association are tied back to the municipality. So if a mayor loses their um, uh, lose the election, then they would lose their function in the association as well. But and and of course there are concerns that saying like yeah okay that that on paper that sounds fine, but uh, we've seen in the past that um, well if Belgrade doesn't want somebody to lose an election in the north, they they have their means of doing that. Yeah, I mean, effectively, we have in the north a one-party system uh, with Serbska Lista. And what my answer to this is, the, actually, the statute improves the status quo as it now, because right now everything is unregulated. And what the statute does is it regulates it. It makes transparency. It goes along the line what Donika just said in terms of let's say it gives the it gives at least the Kosovo state the means to to see what is happening, to make it more transparent. Uh, will there, whether that in the end will furthering uh, ethnic tension, I think that is very much up to, let's say, as all the other institutions in Kosovo about um, political culture, about, and I think a meaningful offer to the Kosovo Serb community. And there I very much agree with Hannes um, to the, um, to the Kosovo Serb community. I mean, uh, we had a um, we had Alvin Kuti for a keynote with the Renner Institute. Uh, Gerhard will remember, let's say, and there you've said very prominently, uh, jobs and justice is our program, and that will that regardless of the ethnicity of of uh, of the citizens. This is a this is an offer I make to all the of the citizens in Kosovo. Now, of course, that that sounds I mean, it's music in in our ears, yeah. Uh, but um, this has to be followed up by very concrete steps. I want to, I want to defend, however, by uh, I want to follow, defend, however, Albin Kuti's uh, difficult position. I think, in the sense that, um, of course, also uh, he is in the, um, he's in the, he, he also has to reflect on the political realities. I think expectations were very high. Uh, we had the same. I think it is still. Let's say that the the government is transformative in the sense of, um, uh, as as Hannes mentioned, uh, uh, non let's say the the war parties being not part of the being not part of it, jobs and justice a more programmatic approach towards politics, but um, as I said, um, also with the with the ASM, I think he, I think their approach is often to wait it out. And that is something both with the, let's say, offer towards the Kosovo Serbs and also the concretely on this association. I think they could have been there more constructive in just uh, presenting something on their on their own, uh, or at least now picking up the uh, uh, picking up, uh, let's say, what is what is on the public discussion. 
but I don't want to make it so easy uh, in terms of just saying and uh, um, let's say uh, it is very that especially among the diplomatic corps there is a lot of frustration with the Kurti government yeah and I think that that is part part of the frustration is actually because uh, the he is a bit more of a difficult conversation partner with Thatchi and the like. I mean, there were always these rumors, like every embassy had a certain file on Thatchi. So if he was really, let's say, so if he could be very easily pressured, let's say, because there was always a wink, like, if you don't agree, then we have something. And what everybody agrees on is that Mr. Kurti is neither corrupt and he's very sincere, I think, and it's very credible in, uh, in his, but yeah, and uh, some say very principled. Other diplomats say very stubborn. And I think part of that frustration is that you cannot pressure him to this certain degree. So, and to those diplomats, I often say, it's like, look, you have asked for years for a government that takes these issues of, uh, let's say, um, more transparency in the public, uh, in the public, uh, uh, in the public sector, fight against organized crime very seriously. Now you have it. So, don't complain if basically the other side of it is that it's sometimes it's getting tougher. They're taking a tougher stance and not saying uh, not saying yes to everything. That being said, I think just um, from the I think the Kurti government could just play it smarter in terms of because there and there I disagree with Hannes and also other analysts. Uh, um, let's say I think. Uh, Ivan Kurti has a, or the Kurti government has an interest of changing the status quo. That is what they've been voted for. I mean, everybody was sick basically of the status quo and coming back to 15 years of independence is like why it takes so long. And coming back to uh, uh, Donika's story, of course, of your father, it's it's basically like, look, there was this there was this feeling like we're not going anywhere. So, and that is why Kurti and Vyosa Osmani were voted into office. Yeah, I mean, mainly of course, Kurti and then Vyosa Osmani when she was still with LDK, but don't want to get into that. But let's say that is they they have been voted into the office to change the status quo. And I think they have an interest of delivering on that. Yeah. Um, and also the European Union and Germany have a, a, I mean, as a German political foundation, I'm referring to the Germans, but I think the, the Austrian government is very aligned on this. Yeah. Um, is they have an interest of changing their status quo. The only in this triage, the only one, the only person or the only, let's say, country and regime that doesn't have an interest in changing the status quo is Serbia. And somehow, so I'm saying, just looking at that situation, I was like, why is it not possible for Kuti to kind of get aligned? Like there's a natural alliance, actually. Both the European Union and Kosovo want to improve the status quo. For Kosovo, it is, as you said, Hannes, in your... Uh, in your blog, it is unfinished business. The quest for a fully integration into international community has not been um, has not been completed, and as such, they, it is in their interest to change it. Um, so my my message is like I think we shouldn't make it too easy, or I think there towards the Kurti government there was some unfair criticism either towards because their expectations were too high. Or the second, let's say, I think it is a feature, not a bug, that they are more principled in their negotiation, um, their negotiation style. Um, and let's say the and and there, um, I would uh, I would again uh, disagree a bit uh, uh, with no I agree actually with Donica on the on the European <laughs> Union stance is uh, sorry uh, I've disagreed on plenty this time actually I agree with you on this one <laughs> is the uh, is the role of the European Union um, I think how how the European negotiates it's basically as if nothing happened in the past five years uh, and we haven't spoken about North Macedonia I mean it may be happened because I'm also responsible for them but I know from personal conversation with Alvin Kuti. The example of Zoran Zaev of making huge concessions towards the path of European Union and, and everybody was very excited with the with the press survey agreement. But in the end, Zoran Zaev is right now not in office, is he? Yeah. Uh, and the European Union didn't deliver on the promises. Yeah. Uh, of course, negotiation starts now, but again with this, let's say, another constitutional uh, uh, constitutional change is needed. So, and I think that informs very much the approach. So, because in the end, whatever is signed in, with this German-French proposal, it will be a leap of faith for Kosovo. 
Yeah, it will be like the, and that is my message also to the German government that is very pressuring very hard right now. The Kosovo government always uh, is like, look, you cannot just expect them to make that leap of faith like nothing happened the past five years. Do you have to give them additional assurances? Sure, you cannot assure them as a the German or any other government cannot assure that Spain the next day will recognize it, but you can you can organize meetings with them. You can uh, let's say make it publicly. Also, that would add pressure to Serbia. So, in that sense, I, I'm saying like yes, the Kurti government could be more constructive on this. Uh, I would I very much agree with Hannes. They should be making a more meaningful let's say outreach to the Kosovo Serb community. Um, I don't think it helped how they handled the crisis. I mean, the crisis last year, like with the number plates, how they handled that by firing the police commander. But that being said, um, um, I think the Kosovo government is doing a lot and is actually, uh, and as such, it is a government that many also international community has asked for in terms of like bringing domestic change. And that somehow isn't really reflected in the, let's say, negotiations. and. And because then they always fall back, like we have to be neutral, which is a bit of a, I think, uh, how you say, uh, a bit of a cheap point. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah. you, you make it also very easy for me to also go to another topic, which I would like to address at least briefly and uh, and discuss with you. Um, um, and this is um, you mentioned the status quo and the status quo, which cannot be which cannot be positive for Kosovo, um, does also mean that there isn't progress when it comes to European Union integration, for example. So Kosovo is now the country in the region with the highest, I would say, positive image of the European Union. Um, while it is going down, you mentioned North Macedonia for the reasons you also mentioned, because the European Union um, was not there and did not keep their promises while they even changed their name. So now, um, however, I think there is another impetus when it comes to enlargement. So this enlargement fatigue of the last um, 15 years now was a little bit, I would say, shaken up, especially by, by uh, the unfortunate happenings uh, in, in Ukraine and also the granting of candidate status to, of course, uh, Ukraine and, and Republic of Moldova. So, Donika, I mean, maybe what do you think for Kosovo right now when it comes to European Union uh, integration? How do you see this story? And what is actually, I mean, you as a Kosovo citizen, what can you also explain to us why it makes sense for us to have you, you know? Um, this is also something which I think is also very important. How can you convince more or less the European Union countries that they would actually gain from Kosovo? So the European context. Um, yeah, oh, I mean, maybe before if I may, going if I, if I may yeah. maybe additional to that, there is already a, a question um, which um, deals with the security resolution 2044, where, um, where it is said that Kosovo is um, part of Serbia, more or less, and, and that Kosovo will not be recognized as a member of the United Nations. So how do you also assess, maybe in a similar context, to address this issue as well? Yeah, I mean, uh, I'll go with this uh, before because this is something that, uh, I mean, it, it, it will not change, unfortunately. I mean, because uh, what we expected, at least what Kosovo expected, and, and I'm, I'm very, very much, you know, sort of supporting Kurti in his uh, sort of pressure on the EU is the five EU non-recognizers to recognize Kosovo, although they cannot uh, legally probably become part of this agreement, this signing agreement, you know, or participate in an agreement signed between Kosovo and Serbia and all species of the EU, but at least, you know, have some sort of commitment that their approach towards Kosovo will soften after, after you know, signing this uh, final agreement between Kosovo and Serbia. And already Greece uh, has, has given signs that, you know, they are probably going to move forward. Uh, we have the soft no recognizers, also Slovakia, Romania, to some extent, you know, being more neutral. But then we have like the, the, the hard no recognizers, you know, the, the Spain, Spain, Spain and, and obviously Cyprus with, you know, constantly, you know, Cyprus even went more extreme saying that even if Serbia says yes, that we are going to have problems with it. But then obviously, you know, like this is about unlocking Kosovo's EU perspective and, and sort of, you know, changing the, uh, the, the situation on the ground when it comes to, you know, having equal sort of, um, um, uh, 
negotiations process on equal footing. But then there is also like the UN and the UN is uh, it's a more difficult issue because I mentioned in the beginning that, you know, in 2008, we could have become ind independent because of the, ge you know, geopolitical set of circumstances, which do not exist today. And today, you know, negotiating on behalf of Kosovo for UN membership, it is going to be very problematic because of course, Russia uh, and this, you know, sort of, you know how, how Russia used Kosovo in international uh, uh, arena and law. It was always, you know, like, I, I don't support it. But then, yes, if, you know, you recognize what I've done in Georgia and Ukraine. And after the war in Ukraine, we don't know how it's going to look like and how many, you know, parts of Ukraine, chunks of Ukraine will be, be under Russian control. So, you know, this increase, increases the Russian negotiation power when it comes to the UN Security Council. But then, of course, there is China. There is, you know, less... The, it's not directly involved in Kosovo Serbia issue, but we know that Taiwan is the elephant in the room, and obviously that is going to be an issue uh, in, in at the UN Security Council. So uh, to sort of undo the 1244, it's not needed just to sign this agreement between Kosovo and Serbia. That is not enough, unfortunately. I've seen a lot of people in Kosovo sort of wanting to, to include that in the final agreement. And the EU cannot do that because, you know, it's a different level of negotiations in which Russia and China come to question. And obviously, with the way that they are, you know, having relations with the EU and US, this is going to be a very, very difficult negotiation process. Uh, and then uh, this, of course, you know, like, of course, mentioning the 1244, the international law, and that's why also Spain does not recognize Kosovo. I mean, it's not just Catalan movement, it's also the fact that they don't agree with, uh, with the way that it was intervened in Kosovo, but also the way Kosovo declared independence. So this is a very crucial issue for which we have been trying to sort of find uh, answers, but still we haven't been able to. Uh, and then there is, uh, of course, what is uh, uh, your question about, you know, like the future in Kosovo and, uh, you know, why is it so pro you? The only thing that all political elites in Kosovo that have done good is the fact that they have never tried to actually antagonize you and never actually tried, even if they tried it was very mild to build this narrative anti-EU, although there, there are a lot of reasons to actually not want EU or not support EU, and that is related also not just to the Brussels uh, dialogue, but also the fact that Kosovo does not have visa liberalizations yet. I mean, obviously in 2024 that's going to enter in force, but into force, but that's another issue. Uh, which we still cannot believe, obviously, because we have lost trust in that regard. Uh, and then, uh, I mean, on, on what you know, on the enlargement, obviously, Rene mentioned the EU leverage and how difficult it is to actually believe in the EU genuine sort of approach in Kosovo Serbia issue because of what happened to North Macedonia. And of course, because it is very sad because our political elites never thought of let's, you know, solve this issue because it's in our benefit. And then every sentence, they, and even we start the sentence like, oh, but what's in there for Serbia to solve the Kosovo issue? Uh, because we always are linking it to the enlargement and enlargement does not exist. We'll stop. I mean, yes, we saw some, you know, sort of movement towards Western Balkans, but that was because of the, you know, pressure coming from, you know, acting on Ukraine and the Republic of Moldova. I mean, the answer given to Bosnia, but also like some visa liberalization for Kosovo, accession negotiations for North Macedonia and Albania. They are good steps, but it doesn't guarantee that EU has a strategic plan on what to do with Western Balkans. So I don't see that, unfortunately, and I don't see how the member states are going to agree in, in, in this regard. And obviously they constantly say like, oh, but what are you going to bring? You're poor, you have a lot of issues and everything. Yes, but you know, like let's take Bulgaria and Romania. I mean, obviously they have been like having a lot of issues, but would they have been better if they were out of the EU? No, they really had progress since then. Uh, so we need this, and this is the only time and the only region where the EU can actually have success. I mean, I work in Eastern Partnership region, and I know how difficult, first of all, they are big countries. Second of all, they have like a lot of open issues with each other, with Russia, and ongoing. And it is very problematic for EU to deliver there, but the EU can still be successful in Western Balkans. So what I wanted to see from the EU is that similarly to how war in, in, in Yugoslavia, former Yugoslavia, has sort of pushed the Central Eastern European countries into the EU, created an impetus for them, and war in Ukraine to create that impetus for us. 
But that did not happen, unfortunately. And we see all the problems that we have that we have on the ground. Uh, and last remark is obviously because we constantly blame the EU, but there are political elites. I was in, in a meeting in Paris and everybody was like, oh, you should do this and that. But none of us actually thought about what our political elites should do, because probably we have lost trust in them. And we do, cannot believe that they can actually function or progress without an external push, which is in, the, in this case, the EU. But our political elites are basically, you know, like not really genuinely engaging in the process. They are very good at ticking boxes approach. They know how Brussels functions. So they really see the country report and they really find, you know, all the potential gaps in which they can yield some sort of success so they can look slightly better than the previous year or they don't care at all. And then, you know, like they are, you know, sort of that's enough for them. Uh, if you look at how, for instance, Vucic behaves, uh, installing all instability pockets, playing on security, wanting to maintain the status quo, playing with the EU, longing for stability. Obviously, you see like political elites that are not interested to actually progress into the EU or make the reforms that will sort of, which they call painful and they're not painful. And I don't know what they call them painful, you know, as if it's bad, you know, to actually reform and, and become democratic. Uh, and then, you know, like genuinely engage in the in the in the process without the EU enlargement on, at the, on the table, they can just do whatever they want. As long as they don't, you know, maintain the status quo, they don't open uh, an open like they don't create any open conflicts on the ground. The EU is happy with it. And this is a problem that we have not only in Kosovo and Serbia, but also in the entire region. Hannes. Um, you're muted. Please unmute, Hannes. Yes, the, the church bell was so loud, so I, I uh, Well, there's not so much to say uh, to add to what uh, Dolika said. Fortunately, she mentioned that I fully uh, share the criticism about the European Union and, and the, the lack of activity. And of course, the opposition of some countries. Of some is, that, that's the question of the decision-making process in the Central European Union. Finally, Bulgaria, for example, on the question of, um, of North Macedonia. But you look to, to the process, uh, just for Kosovo spoke, Serbia. Is Serbia going towards European Union? Formally, they did some reforms, but de facto look to the media pro uh, situation, look to the corruption and to many other issues, foreign policy in Russia is not approaching the European Union. And the same is uh, true for in some different way, but with uh, Montenegro. Yes, uh, the reform were done late because the former government uh, in North Macedonia was not a European government and it may come back again. Maybe also because of Bulgaria's opposition towards opening negotiations uh, with, the, with North Macedonia. Albania needed a lot of time uh, to come to reforms, they did uh, some vital reforms, very good. And Bosnia-Herzegovina, we always see the situation. So it's both sides who are responsible for the stalemate uh, that the European Union should, you know, invent or come forward with some uh, proposals and some invitations to the countries. Yes, that's true, but it's, it's not easy uh, if you see the situation in some of the, of the uh, countries. Now to the question of United Nations uh, has also been answered. On the other hand, what people don't mention, what has to be mentioned as well, is that uh, the International Court uh, decided that the um, uh, Declaration of Independence was not illegal. Because very often people say, well, it's illegal, the UN Security Council. So the court decided on a request from Serbia, because Serbia wanted to have another dis decision, it's not an illegal decision. Now, uh, of course, it's bad, but at the end of the day, uh, we cannot uh, prevent uh, only because of that uh, uh, decision of the or the blockade and the veto and the Security Council to foster and enhance the independence of Kosovo. Again, as I said in the beginning, the countries that decided are absolutely uh, irresponsible for the five members of the European Union in their decision. And I was very, very much not, not astonished because I know the Cyprus uh, situation. Um, if you look to Cyprus, in Cyprus, the, the, the Turkish part in the referendum decided to join uh, 
to make this common uh, Cyprus and to adopt the Annan plan, it was the majority of the Greek side who decided not to have it. So the Cyprus government should be very quiet on this issue because they blocked coming together in, in a common uh, Cyprus and then join commonly the European Union. So uh, if you see that the moral position of these countries is, is unacceptable from, from my point of view. Uh, again, I was often in Cyprus and like the people, but the political decision is, is absolutely wrong. So we should uh, really speak about the reality. Now, finalize, we have to come forward. Uh, there should be some uh, measures uh, taken also by the Kurdish government. We should, of course, put more pressure also on Serbia to go forward. We should more pressure also on, on the commissioner. There are some requests in the European Parliament criticizing and asking the commission how they can accept the position of the commissioner who comes from the urban government originally and is supporting um, developments, especially in Serbia, which are totally unacceptable. So this is a very targeted uh, criticism we should enhance uh, and uh, give the countries, of course, the, the chance. It would be the best if the commissioner would either change this portfolio or leave the commission or at least change his policy and give more uh, impetus to democratic development, to openness, to transparency, and to the fight against corruption and the fight for human rights. These are the issues the European Union should enhance in the, in the whole region, and then the government of the region should respond to that. Thank you, Hannes. I mean, if you say also, since we talked a lot about the non recognizers I think it would also be very important also, also for the national governments within the European Union, those are actually in favor of enlargement to tackle these issues with their counterparts. Today, just today, um, um, Prime Minister Sanchez is in Vienna. And there was this press conference just saying, and Mr. the Chancellor Nehammer mentioned the Western Balkans, but of course not Kosovo. And this is also, you know, this kind of things what I think uh, we should also address within the respective countries and within the governments. And, and I think it's very often lacking, lacking in bilateral, in a bilateral sense as well. And, and also, Hannes, you know, the same is true for the European Parliament. Um, or members of the European Parliament. Um, yeah, maybe uh, René, briefly, what do you think uh, when it comes to the European Union, why is Kosovo important for the European Union? What was not yet mentioned? Thank you, thank you for... Um, so I think it is important because first of all, um, if you talk about enlargement, often uh, often is taught about, okay, uh, the fears are getting uh, governments like Serbia and it's like with a lot of anti-EU ressentiments recent, uh, and something that Mr. Vucic is uh, actually actively fostering. And if you look in comparison to, uh, uh, to Kosovo, I think Donika mentioned it, uh, it is. It has a widespread support for the European way of life. I think uh, I've yet to meet a more convinced. Uh, Euro I mean, uh, okay, uh, Martin Schulz, the president of the Friedrich Ebert Foundation, that is probably uh, the first one. But the second then comes closely with uh, uh, Mr. Albin Kurti. I mean, and, and the long discussions we had. I think he's very convinced. I mean, a very let's say convicted of the of the uh, European Union. But I think very concretely. Um, I think what is sometimes missed is how much active, um, how how much uh, Kosovo is supporting the European Union in their foreign policy. I mean, at the beginning, Donika said, let's say, about independence, both in terms of domestic politics but also foreign policy. Um, it, I didn't know this, but apparently uh, Kosovo has one of the best uh, search and rescue centers uh, um, that uh, in on the European continent. The first ones to fly in, also to provide international ass assistance to Turkey, um, and uh, but also taking, let's say, uh, taking Ukrainian refugees, taking Afghan, Afghan refugees. So in terms of being aligned with the European Common and Defense uh, Foreign and Defense Policy. You cannot uh, you cannot ask more of a government than than the Kosovo government is doing, and that is what I would say in terms of let's say okay uh, I get it that sometimes there especially the Kurti government is a bit more of an uncomfortable conversation partner, but I would very encourage let's say all the capitals in the, within the European Union 
look at their general orientation. They were the first ones to, let's say, uh, to implement sanctions toward Russia, um, taking and supporting every initiative uh, from the uh, from the European Union and are very clear in their support. And I think uh, when it comes to gaining new members, I think that is what uh, I, I think that is what you're looking for, making making the European Union stronger. Thank you so much. We are already coming to the end uh, of our um, chat dialogue. And I would have, though, uh, one last question, which uh, I would like to ask you to answer within like one or two sentences. Um, it should also give like, maybe a little bit also of a positive outlook. And, and the question is uh, 15 years of independence of Kosovo, a success story? Question mark. Donika, you go first. Well, yes, yes, I still believe Kosovo is a success story. And if we manage to complete it internationally, it will be probably one of the, yeah, the only case that actually started with a successful NATO intervention because all NATO operations are successful according to them. It's a peace building process that actually, you know, fails. And if we manage to actually complete the puzzle by a sort of adding to to that success of NATO intervention that will we will be all proud of it and I believe completing it is the only sort of way to have stability and peace in the Balkans and the uh, um, the narrative of the 90s and actually move forward all of us and not just Kosovo. Hannes, Kosovo success story? Absolutely, I would invite everybody to to go to Pristina and to other places, and you see, uh, if you saw it uh, some years ago, or 10, 15 years ago, you see the difference. And uh, it is a success story. There are nice people, they are very engaged, they are very, uh, try to build up a new country. Yes, it's a success story, but every success story has some dark spots, and we spoke perhaps more about the dark spots, and not about the success, but the the big issue is the success of Kosovo, yes. Rene. Yeah, I think it is a success story. Of course, relatively always speaking is like, say, where they're coming from a war-torn country, gaining independence against ch international challenge. And as I just said, let's say, I, within their means, let's say, trying really are very, let's say, uh, to, the, to the capabilities to being an active member of the international community that takes on responsibility. And as such, I think... Uh, I think it is a success story. I think also in domestic politics, it is a success story because as I mentioned is like, we really had a change. I think it is a transformative change when in 2019 and then in 21, the electorate voted very differently and said like, we want something new and that is just an expression of the democratic culture. Uh, I want to say also um, that, I mean, we've mentioned a lot the statute that we produced. I think it is a, it is a very contentious issue and you ask about feedback, and I think that is a testament to Kosovo's democratic culture. Yes, it is a contentious issue. A lot of people feel very, very strongly about it. Did I ever, or any of my staff, had the had had fears for their personal safety? No. Like yeah. it is very. That is, a, and I think it just speaks in terms of the um, let's say if, uh, rights in terms of freedom of expression. I think that is something where it is actually a, a lighting beacon in the in the region, and. Last but uh, last but not least, on the why it is, I think a success story. I think we're right now we're at a critical juncture, and to those who who might have joined us now and only hear Kosovo because when it's in the news with these crises, etc., I would really encourage you to, as Anna said, come visit, uh, get more engaged because paradox paradoxically, I think the tensions that we had last winter, I mean this December and the winter before is actually because things are moving forward. Yeah, and that is, let's say, and, and that is why we're getting heightened tensions because not everybody likes to change the status quo, but I think that is happening and that's why I think it's a success story. Thanks. And sorry, Stephanie, if I may, Please. I mean, in addition to inviting everybody to travel to Kosovo, which is actually <laughs> a very good idea. And I, I miss it dearly. I cannot wait to go back there. Uh, the thing is that, uh, being successful in the dialogue is just not for the sake of Kosovo and Serbia. It's also for the EU and not, not because of stability, because, you know, like the EU foreign policy and, and uh, uh, sort of 
in a way, all that transformation happened around the case of Kosovo. You know, the post-Lisbon uh, uh, situation, building the EU institutions, dealing with foreign policy and security, the EU taking a lead as global actor, serious global actor in international negotiations, peace building, conflict uh, resolution and all of that. So all this structural diplomacy that the EU could actually use was the case of Kosovo, in which it has it had presence through a civilian mission, like, you know, like the rule of law mission of ULEX. It had presence through the EU membership uh, process. It was there through and it is there through the Brussels dialogue. It has all the elements to actually be successful and tell the world like, look, you know, we have come from, you know, the 90s when we were actually struggling to create a common foreign policy and security, which took shape institutionally in 2000 and, you know, 2009 with Lisbon and all. And we applied it in the case of Kosovo and we are successful and not get stuck in the middle well having all the cards the good cards to actually play eu membership and financial aid and uh, you know the eu is deeply deeply present everywhere in kosovo i think if they have a success story in kosovo they can handle other cases easily and it will be a very good starting point in the case of ukraine because obviously after the war in ukraine there will be a lot to deal with in a post-conflict country and you know taking success stories from Kosovo will definitely help the EU lessons learned obviously we weren't the first ones but you know lessons learned from Kosovo can really serve a good create a good basis for the EU to actually be even more successful in Ukraine perfect final remarks uh, Donika thank you so much and, and I think there are so many positive things and I like this uh, last question how you answered it very differently from different perspectives and we didn't manage now to even talk about the vibrant civil society which is also there in Kosovo and it, it is okay. quite surprising in the region and especially if you compare it to neighboring Serbia for example and so a lot to say, uh, still a long way to go, um, but it is a step into the right direction if it has been done in, in good faith, as you said, uh, René, if it also includes other elements. I mean, an agreement cannot tackle all the issues within the country, within the people and, and within communities and, and, and also the foreign actors. Let me thank you very much for your time and, and for, for the interest also to our audience. A big thank you to the Renner Institute, our perfect partner for all the events we're doing, especially on the Western Balkans. Uh, the event was recorded. Uh, we're going to put it on our website and iipvienna.com, but also on the Carl Renner Institute's website. And, um, yes, stay tuned and thank you so much. Enjoy your evening and it was a pleasure to, to speak to you. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you.